Hello and welcome to Worship Online with White Bear Lake United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Bill Eves and along with Pastor Christine Ford, I thank you for being with us today. White Bear Lake United Methodist Church exists to provide nourishment for the hungers of life. In our worship today, we trust God to nourish our hungers and we watch for ways to go out and nourish the hungers of the world around us. Today we're in the second segment of our sermon series called The Spiritual Work of Election Season. Voting is both a responsibility and a gift, and we all have some inner preparation that we as people of faith can do to carry out that responsibility and to receive that gift. So now, let's worship together.
Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. The parable of a good Samaritan. An expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to vindicate himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him and took off, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down down that road and when he passed by the other side, so likewise, a levit. When he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while well, traveling, came upon him, and when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, treating them with oil and wine. Then he put his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay whatever more you spend. Which of these do you think was a neighbor of to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy, Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This year, more than 70 countries around the world are conducting national elections. Together, they encompass 44% of the world's population, including large populous nations like India, Pakistan, and Indonesia, but also smaller ones like the Caribbean island of Montserrat, which has fewer than 4,000 people of voting age. Nearly a third of the elections will take place in authoritarian regimes like Iran, Belarus, Venezuela. This year, half of the voters who go to the polls worldwide will be under 30 years old. This could rewrite the history of the world or at least shift the geopolitical landscape. Elections are reality for us right now, and we have that in common with Russia and Mexico and India. What should the role of Christians or other people of faith be in an election season or even in the political life of a country? If we had the ear of President Biden or President Putin or President Zelensky, what should we be saying to them? I think for many people of faith, that seems like a touchy question. And that's mostly because we have historically been given two messages about politics and religion. A lot of Christians have been told in so many words that politics is a dirty game and we should leave it to the politicians while we teach people how to say their prayers and go to heaven. Now, it's clear that we leave partisan politics out of church. That's important to remember. But I think most of us realize that keeping our own faith and our political beliefs separate simply doesn't reflect the Bible in general or Christian witness. But we're not sure what we would do if we were to be involved politically as people of faith. And the second message is kind of at the opposite extreme, that politics is our only salvation and everything has to happen through political movements. Some have even taken Jesus' words at the end of Matthew's gospel, where he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me to mean that Jesus is telling Christians that we should be running the world, and even that we Christians are the only ones who should be. And we've seen some really bad examples around the world of people who try to use their religion to take power and make everybody conform to their way. We've seen examples of people who made religion and politics inseparable 
And that has never turned out to be a good thing. So let's put both of those messages up against what Jesus says in the gospel when he tells a story about a good Samaritan. There's something about this story that is so iconic and powerful. There's a lesson in it about helping others in need, for sure. But everybody helps those in their own inner circle, people who can pay them back or people who are like them. The point of the Good Samaritan parable is that really loving our neighbor looks like tangible service at some cost to ourselves, even when it's someone outside our own ethno-religious group that needs the help. Good Samaritans are the sorts of people Jesus wants to present to the world to say, these are my representatives. Whenever I talk about the Good Samaritan, I always want us to be sure that we get the reason that Jesus told this story in the first place. So here's the setting. A legal expert, a lawyer, comes up to Jesus one day with a question. What do I have to do to get eternal life? Jesus turns the question back to him. What does the law say? The law being the law of Moses, the religious law that functioned also as civil law in that time and place. Well, the man says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus answers, yes, right, do that and you will have eternal life. But the man is a lawyer, so he has a follow-up question, a technical question. Who is my neighbor? Now, I hope you can hear the tone in his question. He asks, who is my neighbor? But I think he's really asking, who is not my neighbor? Who can I dismiss? Where are the loopholes in this love your neighbor business? Jesus answers with this story about the man who was traveling down the road was beaten, robbed of everything, including his clothes, and left for dead. A temple priest comes by and doesn't stop to help. A Levite does the same. Both of these people have specific roles and rules that they have to live by. But what Jesus wants to show us is that the two people you would think would be the most likely ones to stop and help don't do it. And that sets up the next scene in the story where a Samaritan comes along. For the people listening to Jesus as he told this story, a Samaritan was the worst person imaginable. Samaritans were a despised mixed race, considered foreigners by the Jews, unclean, people who provoked disgust. Just let your own imagine, imagination fill in the blanks of who it would be for you today. A Nazi, an undocumented person, a convicted sex offender, a Russian, a member of the Taliban, who would it be? That's the person who stops to help in this story. That's the person who takes the risk. Because there would always be a risk when you stumble upon a crime scene and try to help. That's the kind of scene Jesus has described. It's a challenge parable. And with it, Jesus is challenging us to change from being paranoid to being a neighbor. Who is my neighbor is the most central question for us as people of faith. Who is in and who is out? Who belongs and who doesn't? The parable of the Good Samaritan provides a framework for thinking about politics, too. If we think of it as a challenge to move from the politics of paranoia to the politics of the neighbor. Today we live in a world where the message of paranoia is widespread. Proponents of white Christian nationalism continue to promote the belief that this nation was founded as a Christian nation for white people and that it should continue to be a white Christian nation. Those who promote this belief use Christian language to cloak sexism and hostility to black people and non-white immigrants in their quest to create a white Christian country. They draw a line between real Americans and others 
including legal immigrants, who don't deserve the same rights. It's very different from patriotism. Christians recognize that patriotism can be a good thing because all of creation is good, and patriotism helps us to appreciate our particular place in it. It helps us to recognize what makes us unique, what makes us American. Our affection and loyalty to a country helps us do the good work of cultivating and improving the part of creation that we live in. To be Christian and American means we can love our country by also holding it up for critique and working for justice when it airs. White Christian nationalism begins with the idea that a nation is a coherent cultural group that has a shared language, a shared religion, a shared ethnicity, a shared culture. Paul Miller, a specialist in nationalist movements, who also worked in both the George W. Bush and the Barack Obama White Houses, has made the point that nations almost never operate that way in reality. Cultures have always overlapped. Their borders are fuzzy. Cultural identities are fluid and hard to draw boundaries around. White Christian nationalists insist that America must be a Christian nation and that the government should take active steps to keep it that way. That white Christians should enjoy a privileged position in it. So the problem for people of faith is that when Christian nationalists go about constructing their nation, they have to define who is and who is not part of the nation. In past generations, this belief has been used to prop up slavery, segregation, and the oppression of women. The fact that it takes the name of Christ makes it particularly dangerous for people of faith who hold to Jesus' teaching about the neighbor in the parable of the Good Samaritan. It is taking the name of Jesus as a kind of fig leaf to cover its political program, hijacking the message of Jesus to be a tool of political power. The main difference between white Christian nationalism and what the Good Samaritan shows us is this. The first seeks power for itself and to put itself in a privileged position. The second seeks to serve others who are often outside of our own group and often does it at some cost to ourselves. The Good Samaritan took the risk of stopping to be involved with the person who had been robbed, stripped, beaten, and left by the side of the road. He bandaged his wounds, used his own animal to take him to get help, and sacrificed to pay for his care when it was beyond what he could do. The Good Samaritan shows us that our neighbor is not always just the person next door. So inspired by the Good Samaritan, I believe that we as people of faith should hold up this image of compassion and offer a moral compass that can transform our life, culture, and politics. And it goes deeper than politics, deeper than power, deeper than self-interest. Followers of Jesus have always understood their faith to challenge, affect, and transcend their worldly loyalties. But there is no single view on what political implications flow from Christian faith other than to love God and to love our neighbor. May the wisdom and power of our scriptures offer guidance and support and encourage and sustain us and assist us in this vital work we need to be doing right now. What Jesus says to us now is love God and love your neighbor. And maybe this foreigner, this good Samaritan, can help to show us the way. Amen.
Let us come together now and take a moment to just be. I invite you to take a deep breath and ground yourself into the earth, feeling your feet on the floor, your back in your chair. Let your shoulders drop and let your jaw unclench. Just take in the moment as we open our hearts and our minds in prayer. Gracious God, we come before you inspired by the story and the work of the Good Samaritan. Open our hearts to recognize those in need around us, regardless of differences in background or belief. Help us to look beyond our own comfort and to act with compassion and mercy reflecting your unconditional love in all that we do. Teach us to see every person as our neighbor, worthy of care and kindness. 
may we not turn away from those who suffer, but rather reach out with open hands and hearts. Strengthen us to build a community rooted in love, understanding, and service. As we walk in faith, may our actions echo your grace and bring hope to a weary world. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. We invite you to join us in person for worship on Sunday mornings for our Traditions Worship at 9 a.m. and our New Crossing service at 1045. You can find out more about our church and what's going on by visiting our website, wblumc.org. As we end our worship today, may the love of God embrace us. May the grace of Jesus challenge us. May the power of the Holy Spirit renew us. Amen. Thank you.